All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, I now call this special meeting of the Isla Vista Community Services District Board of Directors to order, uh, 6 p.m. Tuesday, May 30th, and I'd like to announce that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, Secretary Brett, you can take the roll. Director Bertrand. Present. Director Jordan. Present. Director Brandt, I'm here. Director Freeman. Here. Director Hedges. Here. Director Geis. Here. Director Thurlow. Okay, we have a quorum. Uh, George Thurlow is at a conference uh, learning about university relations with small towns, so hopefully he'll have some good things to bring back to us in a few weeks. An expert. Um, and uh, real quick, what we're going to do is um, we have a kind of moderate sized group, but if you just want to raise your hand, say your name just uh, to build some community, go around uh, starting oh, over here. Sue, so, Janet, Amaya, Jackson, sure. Ayana, Sue, Jonathan, Sam, Kevin. Oh, Steven. Daniel. Dan Ryan. Gabby. Justin. Alshaba. Allie. Austin. Yuri. Kelly. Kim. Carlos. Geneva. Woodrow. Samantha. I'm from Assembly Member Moving Home Loans Office. Kristen. Rose. Jasmine. Brooke. Keon. Grayson. Hugh. Ruben. I gave you the choice. Megan, good to you. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on how we got here, so we recently began our discussions with the university on providing services for the Community Services District. Um, as many of you may know, in the fall, Measure F, our tax measure, did not pass, which left us with um, a big gap in our anticipated funding. However, over the next seven years, UCSB has pledged to contribute $200,000 per year for mutually agreed upon projects. Um, and at the forefront of both the university's priorities and our priorities as a board are public safety. And we are going to be moving forward about discussions on possible projects that we can embark on together. Um, and before we did that, I, all of us wanted to have an opportunity to kind of update the community on what our ideas have been thus far, and more importantly, get your feedback. Um, so without further ado, we're going to begin just this brief presentation. Uh, we're going to try to go through this quick, but it's just kind of give some background. And then after that, we're going to open it up for community discussion. Um, what's that? Um, so as we mentioned before, Measure F was the funding mechanism. But Measure E, people who don't know, you have a copy of this presentation in your hands. Yes, uh, in the board packets, there are uh, printed slides. Um, so Measure E was the uh, ballot measure that created the Isla Vista Community Services District. It passed with 87% of the vote, um, so a big margin of Isla Vista voters advocating for greater self-governance. Um, created through Assembly Bill 3, the Isla Vista Community Services District has eight distinct services. Uh, here tonight we're going to focus especially on our um, power to contract for additional police protection services, but our other services include financing the operations of a municipal advisory council, um, a parking district, a uh, tenant landlord mediation program, graffiti abatement, um, working on sidewalks, sliders, and gutters, um, also community facilities, and um, exercising the powers of a parking district. Uh, those are our unique uh, services that we're empowered to provide through our state legislation. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Spencer Brandt, uh, also director on the CSD. So, um, as stated in Assembly Bill 3, which to give a little bit of background, Assembly Bill 3 is the framework with which this body was created. Um, so this text that you see on the screen is text that comes straight out of the government code, basically the law that was created that established us. It says, over the, over the last year, the Isla Vista community has been faced with many challenges due to tragic events, including multiple injuries from students falling off cliffs, multiple violent sexual assaults, riots, a mass murder, and homicides that have brought focus to the unique needs of Isla Vista that can only be addressed by direct local governance. Following these events, a local coalition was formed to determine the best direction for Isla Vista self-governance, and the Community Services District has garnered much local support. So there's a little bit of information about the framework that's been set up uh, by the participation of many people here today um, that's gotten us to this point. Uh, so now we're going to speak about Isla Vista's current public safety issues and efforts. Uh, this will not be an exhaustive list, and we're going to have a lot of time to talk about this, but this is just uh, some, some things to start the conversation. So as far as public safety issues in Isla Vista, a lot of the big ones that come to mind are sexual assault, theft and burglary, public intoxication, 
injuries from cliff falls, robbery, assault, and um, Halloween and Deltopia related incidents. We are going to talk about these a little bit individually later, but those were just a few that came to mind that we were really concerned about and want to discuss. But a little more on sexual assault. Um, over the last year in 2016, there was a significant increase. Um, as far as in Isla Vista, there was more than double. Um, and that was 48 uh, sexual assaults reported to Isla Vista Foot Patrol and 23 forcible rapes. Um, Ruben, could you confirm that those are two separate statistics? Uh, that's that's it's how all it, part of uh, the 48. Uh, the 48 that have been reported don't all meet the, the forcible rape uh, statistics. Like we have 48 uh, reported uh, sexual assaults, but 23 of those met the, 40, the forcible <laughs> rape. Okay. Perfect. So, but it's still do it's doubled uh, compared to the year before. Oh, thank you. Um, and 74% of those occurred on weekends between 9 p.m. Um, and 11 p.m. 40% of the suspects were acquainted with victims, so uh, a, a lot of it was with people that folks knew. Um, alcohol was involved in more than half of the reported sexual assaults, and I just want to say that um, in, in no way are we saying that that matters for why this is occurring, but it is good to know that it, it is involved. Um, and women ages 18 to 24 have been among uh, the most likely to be victim to this horrible crime. So uh, according to the 2016 Isla Vista Safe Report, um, these are some of the current public safety efforts uh, that are going on in Isla Vista. And I'll say just as a little background that the IV Safe uh, Committee is a committee that the district attorney convened in response to a lot of the issues that were occurring in 2014. So the Community Resource Deputy, which is a position at the Isla Vista Foot Patrol that really deals with establishing community relations and uh, building community trust, doing outreach. Um, that person is James. I don't know if he's here with us tonight, no, he but make it, yeah, he he's off. He often comes to these yeah. things, though, for some context, so you may know him. Um, community policing uh, through the Isla Vista Foot Patrol uh, and UCPD. Community service officers, uh, which I think a lot of us are familiar. Uh, they ride around on bikes and they walk around and uh, assist folks uh, when they need uh, help, whether it's just a walk home or they need some sort of a liaison uh, to law enforcement. Um, outreach events such as coffee with a cop and pizza with police to really build uh, that community police trust. Um, SACEIV, uh, which is the Santa Barbara Rape Crisis Center's Sexual Assault Counseling and Education Program uh, in Isla Vista. The Green Dot Program for Bystander Intervention, which is another thing that deals uh, with sexual assault. Um, rape Aggression Defense, uh, or RAD courses. Uh, and UCIV volunteers, which I'm sure many people in the room uh, have volunteered with through associated students, uh, and also alternative programming during Halloween and Deltopia, which alternative program just programming essentially just means things that are happening during Halloween and Deltopia that aren't just house parties. Yeah, and uh, just to go into detail about some of the programs that we just mentioned, uh, the Community Service Officer Program, uh, it operates to serve UCSB students and community members by uh, student workers serving as liaison between law enforcement and, uh, and, the, and students. Uh, they patrol the UCSB campus uh, every day of the year. Um, their function is to report crimes in progress by serving as an extra eye, eyes and ears, uh, assist in emergency situations, help detect safety hazards, fulfill special security needs in resident halls and during special events, and uh, they're responsible for the bicycle safety education program. The objectives of the program are to provide a safe learning and living environment for UCSB students, to encourage safety consciousness within the campus community, to provide a positive link between students and UCPD, to establish an open line of communication on a peer group level, and to encourage bicycle safety and awareness. Um, as far as the escort program, which uh, that's something that we are really interested in, um, it's a free service provided to all students, faculty, and community members during every evening, night, and early morning to s provide a safer mode of transportation. It's based on the buddy system, so CSO officers um, escort community members either on foot or if they're on bike, they'll ride along with you. Um, and they're equipped with radios to be in constant communication with law enforcement officers. Um, and these students aren't bodyguards. They are there to help out, um, but if something gets out of hand, they're trained to call, call for an officer. And um, they can be requested by phone, uh, by dialing the number, or on the emergency phones located throughout campus. 
So these are some of the efforts that have been going on uh, in regards to Halloween and Deltopia, the two biggest events in Isla Vista in terms of numbers uh, per year. Um, there have been efforts to create alternative activities and, and events on campus such as the concerts that Associated Students and the University throw. Uh, Snoop Dogg uh, was one my first year and fits in the Chantrums uh, for Halloween. Uh, more recently uh, there was also, what else was there, there's YG and there was, um, I don't remember the other one, I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd and I didn't go to it. Um, there's um, there's there's also uh, just a lot of community outreach done in terms of raising awareness uh, for keeping these events local uh, and keeping them safe. Uh, this idea that uh, we're not going to invite in uh, a bunch of people uh, who may be our friends, uh, but we're not going to invite a bunch of people into our community um, who don't have that same attachment to it that we do, uh, so that we can make sure um, that we are, you know, we're we're having fun with with our friends who are uh, who have that attachment to the community, and then so here are some of the uh, statistics uh, which have demonstrated a pretty significant decrease in terms of the citations and arrests uh, as compared to the starting point of 2013-2014. One of the things that this statistic doesn't show also is the crowd sizes uh, at these events. Um, and so, for example, it, within the last uh, iteration of Deltopia in 2017, the crowd size was, I think, about twice what it was in 2016. But the uh, statistics uh, are relatively stagnant uh, in terms of arrests and, and medical transports as well. <coughs> and um, I just want to recognize we were just joined by our third district supervisor. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know her, uh, Joan Hartman. Thank you for being here, supervisor. Um, and now uh, to go into the UCIV program, uh, I could speak about it, but we have one of the leaders here, Sam. If you, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Okay. Well, I want to hear from you later. Um, but so uh, UC, UCIV, um, it's a volunteer student program initially organized for Deltopia in 2015. Um, their function is to look out for people in need of assistance um, and to serve as liaisons and kind of an intermediary between law enforcement and the community. Um, the difference between, um, say, a CSO and UCIV participants, um, UCIV participants are volunteers, CSOs, they're workers, um, but UCIV is organized independent from law enforcement, so it's truly a student effort. Um, when they see something that's alarming, they'll call for assistance, um, but their top priority is to just be out there and connect people with anything that may help them out. And uh, Sam will tell us more about that later. Um, but one more thing on that, it started out just for those uh, Deltopia and Halloween weekends, but now it's uh, almost every weekend around the year. So the Rape uh, Aggression Defense Program, so this is a free class series that's offered by uh, UCSB PD, or UCPD uh, for students, staff, and faculty. Uh, it's four three hour long courses uh, of training uh, initially it was for uh, women only, but now uh, it is also available for men as well. Um, this is the largest uh, women's self-defense training program in the entire county, um, and it's taught by more than 350 universities and law enforcement departments. Um, this really provides students with the knowledge to make an educated decision about uh, personal self-defense. Um, and it teaches some realistic tactics and techniques that doesn't really require students to be athletic or come from an athletic background. Um, it's really welcoming to all ages, uh, abilities, uh, experience, strengths. Another community policing program, uh, there's the Sheriff's Citizen Academy, which is in partnership between the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office, uh, UCSB Police Department, and uh, the City of Goleta Police Department through the Sheriff's Office. Um, an eight-week interactive course with uh, three-hour classes on topics covering active shooter training, search and seizure law, building searches, arresting control, firearms, and canine operations. So it's an in-depth look into the experience of being a law enforcement officer in this community. It's an opportunity for um, residents and students to uh, get to see something that they don't see every day and hopefully in the process build stronger relationship between community members and law enforcement. It's uh, been a successful program and in the past few uh, cohorts it's been specifically focused on Isla Vista residents uh, and UCSB community members. Um, and now just a few efforts and services and other communities that we'll touch on. So uh, in Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, um, they have something that's called the Student Neighborhood Assistant Program. 
So this is a program that in some ways is analogous to how we have the CSOs, but it's a little bit different. Um, what the SNAP, uh, what the SNAP officers, or I, I, I don't know exactly know what their title is, but what, what they do is they work with the police departments to address no, local noise complaints. Um, San Luis Obispo uh, is similar to Isla Vista in, in that um, we have a, there, there's a population of, of students that are relatively concentrated, but there are also uh, a lot of long-term residents as well, um, even more so than I would say here. And so in order to kind of bridge that gap between the relations of the two groups, um, you, you, what you see is uh, the students who handle the noise complaints going and talking to other students who are making a lot of noise, throwing a party, whatever it is, um, and uh, allowing law enforcement, therefore, to focus on more pressing crime and more pressing issues. Um, these folks are non-sworn, um, but they are able to be uh, more, they're, they're able to um, have that peer-to-peer -peer interaction sort of like UCIV does, but just in a more formal fashion. And um, this is much different, but another uh, community policing program in the region. Uh, the city of Santa Barbara uses uh, CSOs to work on State Street. Um, to work primarily with um, with people who are tourists in need of directions, uh, to work with local businesses, and to work with the homeless population uh, using non-sworn personnel. That's really uh, the part we wanted to emphasize here, just another example of using civilians and community members um, to perform duties that were otherwise performed by police officers. Um, and as far as uh, possibilities for the future, um, first one I'll mention um, expansion of the community service officer program. This is something that I've heard a lot of interest in. Um, it's something that we've discussed at this board. It's also um, called for in the UCSB Foundation Trustees Report that um, was conducted a few years ago, of which uh, the creation of the Community Services District actually sprung out of. Um, so this has been something that's uh, been desired by many. And essentially what we've discussed isn't expanding the CSO program to do an active patrol in Ala Vista. Um, but just to be more accessible for students in need of, in need of escorts. Uh, right now, on a weekend night, uh, anyone can get served by a CSO, but a lot of people um, might not want to call and wait, uh, whether because they don't want to stand out in the darkness or because um, they're just uncomfortable being alone. What we're, one of our ideas has been to have a designated, designated location where uh, people will know that they can find CSOs and they can walk over and get an escort from there. Friends can bring their friends there, someone can go there alone. Just one idea, we can, we'll talk about it uh, more later. Um, but that was uh, one of our ideas for the future. So the SNAP program, again, this is something that they do uh, in San Luis Obispo. It's a partnership between uh, Cal Poly and San Luis Obispo Police Department. It's something that was discussed a lot during the AV3 community engagement process, which were a series of meetings that were held weekly for over the course of, I think, a little over a year and a half in this room where you're sitting right now um, that really parsed out some of the details about how us as the CSD would operate. Um, and what abilities and authorities we would have, but also um, dove into the conversation of uh, what some of the services that we could provide might look like. Um, it would use, utilize student workers uh, to be the first responders to noise complaints uh, in a more formal role uh, than we currently see uh, done right now. Um, they would issue warnings uh, and then officers and deputies would be called to the scene um, for any future uh, issues that exist at that given residence. Um, another idea that has been discussed, um, especially on the UCSB side, as just something to look into, uh, not necessarily something that the C CSD does, but perhaps something that it's involved with, um, bringing on a sexual, invest a sexual assault investigator to Isla Vista. Um, right now on campus, there's a sexual assault investigator through the UCSB Police Department. Um, and from what I understand in Isla Vista, there is not a dedicated um, sexual assault investigator. So it's been discussed to uh, look into that, um, to provide better services for, for victims and to overall deter sexual assault. Um, so the Isla Vista Sobering Center is another thing uh, that there have been discussions about over the past uh, year or so. So this would be to provide a safe place for students who are under the influence uh, to stay uh, until they're capable of returning home. 
Um, it's kind of used to serve as a substitute for the idea of a drunk take tank. Um, it would make it so that instead of students getting booked uh, in the jail where they normally would uh, if they were uh, apprehended for um, being intoxicated in public, then they would go to this sobering center uh, and wouldn't have to uh, wouldn't have to deal with the same sort of uh, things that they would about you know having to go to jail. Um, so people who went to the center uh, would participate in educational alcohol and drug seminar uh, to help provide them with the necessary resources in the aftermath. Um, and this is an idea, like I said, that was previously proposed but didn't really receive the support or the funding to move it forward. Um, so this is an idea that has been talked about that uh, the CSD could be involved with as well. Awesome. And um, at this time, we've gone through uh, that presentation that we just wanted to put out there as a, as a background for this discussion. Um, and we're going to go into the community discussion part. But before that, does anyone have any clarifying questions on uh, anything that was just pre presented? I see a hand back there. Yes, yeah, Carlos. Carlos. Uh, yeah, could you go into a little bit more detail about the sexual assault investigator on campus? Like, um, is it an office or how many, is it just one person? Or is there any sort of measure for effectiveness on how effective this office or person is in investigating sexual assaults on campus? Uh, perhaps Chief Olson or Assistant Chief Farley could speak on that. So, for, I can start off. Um, so, for the university, what we did is we, we partnered with, with Kim and uh, the Women's Center. Uh, was Karen, and through a grant, um, a historical grant, um, they funded half the position of an interpersonal violence detective um, who received very specific training around this community type um, as well as trauma type of training. And they're very involved with connecting resources to an individual survivor as well as bringing um, um, investigations together. Okay, I guess I'm yeah, wondering is there anywhere online you can see like kind of like raw data for how many cases are handled? Like of course like anonymous, but like just overall numbers for how often. Like Some of that Kim probably is coming through yeah. through the grant because it's a reporting function that we're also doing through the grant. Okay. It is not anywhere online, but it's <coughs> useful information. Definitely through the care office. Through the care office, okay. And then of course the students are going to be on the so again, half of it's being funded at this point through the grant, half through us, and then we're looking at continuing with that model um, even when the grant is over because it's been so successful um, in the response that we've received from survivors. Good. How long has it been going on? So the grant actually wraps up uh, this September, and it's a three-year cycle, so 2014 is when it came online okay. in this um, really clear, defined role, although there has been work in that same vein that led up to that uh, distinct partnership back in fall of 2014. And just to clarify, is that only on campus, or does that program extend into Isla Vista at all at this time? It doesn't. It, it um, is primarily dedicated to campus. And just to you know, touch on the other pieces, it, it pulls in a coordinated response from the campus perspective, um, and particularly with our Title IX office, mm -hmm. um, which is very, very helpful, I think, for, for students to look at, obviously, the uh, other side of an administrative investigation potential. Thank you. Any other uh, clarifying questions? Jeremy? Yeah, so I'm wondering if under um, the auspices of, of public safety, if that would include in the board's mind um, mental health. I'm not seeing that listed here. Uh, it seems to me that when we talk about trauma, mental health um, has to be a part of that conversation. Um, and when we talk about safety, you know, just a uh, mental health is also part of that equation, but I'm not seeing it listed on, on any of the specific items here today. Thank you. I, uh, I absolutely agree with that. Um, definitely uh, something to discuss. Father John. Uh, one thing that might be noted is it very definitely is not excluded. Okay. When we're talking facilities, when we're talking public safety, that uh, component which obviously in our recent history here is a, is a very important component, <coughs> was not excluded. So I would say it uh, is potentially there. Thank you. Any other uh, clarifying questions before we open it up? I just want to follow up with that. Is that, would mental health most likely fall under in terms of the powers that the, that the CSD has to enact? Would it most likely fall under the public safety power or is there another power that it might more 
policy? Sure. So we don't have a broad public safety power. Our power is specifically to contract for additional police protection services. Okay. So it wouldn't fall there. But we do have the power to operate uh, community facilities. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably where it would come most close to. And just to throw an idea on the table, if I might, just as a, as a citizen, uh, the crisis stabilization units that have been created within the county um, are, are very artfully responding sort of in between the cracks of long-term solutions and sort of in the moment, uh, in that moment of crisis, uh, a place where one might turn where things wouldn't get worse. And Jay? Yeah, I was in and since I was going to bring up that that is something that we would be able to possibly do under our powers to, for example, um, increase the scope of the um, uh, gold crisis stabilization units, yeah, yeah. Um, which is just a mechanism by which if there is, really, uh, hopefully we're talking about the same thing, yeah. um, that mechanism by which if there's somebody um, that the police uh, are, are called out to, but really there should be mental health workers there in order to be called uh -huh. out to, that they, have, they will actually bring the right people in. And so we could, for example, make increased training to make certain that that always happens. Just, just to clarify a little bit, it's sort of the corollary to the concept of a, a quote, uh, alternative to a drunk tank, let's say. Um, you know, it's, it's a place where someone in the moment might receive uh, that treatment which was appropriate for the moment to stabilize them, to make them safe, to get them to the next step. Thank you. Um, so now uh, this, we're going to have this in two parts. First, we're <coughs> going to open it up for people to voice what their public safety concerns are. And after that, we'll talk about ideas for um, programs, services, or other solutions, whether that's commentary on anything that's been presented and hopefully new ideas that you all may have. Um, but first up, let's talk about um, public safety concerns. If you want to expand on any of the concerns we highlighted, if you want to talk about concerns that are personal to you, anything you want to share within that, um, now would be a good time, and we'll come back to the board at the end to discuss it, but we're going to go out to the public first. Um, so does anyone want to raise their hand? Uh, Daniel? Yeah. Um, well, I guess something that wasn't mentioned, and I don't believe that the numbers are incredibly large or anything, but I do believe it deserves some talking about, is how like uh, police officers respond to like, hate crimes. I know very recently um, there was a hate crime uh, in one of our parks where a member of the LGBT community was assaulted. And that took a really, really long time to be released to the public. Um, I know the Resource Center for Sexual and Gender Diversity, they didn't even hear about it until I believe you know, Director Burnett brought it up to them, which was like, like a week after <laughs> the incident had happened. And when you're part of these communities and, and you're physically getting, people in your community are physically getting assaulted because of your identity, that's something that people need to know about ASAP. Um, Thank you. And if you will keep your hands raised, I can make a list so that we can make this more seemly. Cool. Uh, we'll go over here next. But uh, raise your hands and uh, Spencer will get you down. Cool. Uh, so um, in that vein, essentially, I'm kind of worried. I didn't get an email from UCSB. Usually we get the timely warnings from them whenever crimes occur. But recently there was the stabbing and robbery that happened on um, Del Playa and Pardal, I believe, um, respectively, and so I'm wondering uh, why we did, like, I just didn't get an email about that. Um, the first time I heard about it was early that morning, and then I heard the comment from somebody that, oh, well, I was walking home, like, at that time, it would have been really nice to know before I walked out the door. So, uh, timely response and better reporting for incidents? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Keon? Mm -hmm. Like almost a month ago, uh, I was at a party and um, my friend was complaining, like quickly up and said someone was broken girl at the party. So I confronted him. He proceeded to um, head on me and brandish a knife at me. Um, he was then arrested. This is all on video too, by the way. <coughs> and this was almost like three, four weeks ago. I saw him receive a single email call about it. And the next day, my friend said they saw him walking around DP. So it would just be nice to like have, you know, even if I understand that you get a lot of, there's a lot of volume and there's uh, other things going on, but like just like an email saying we have the case, just the case file. Um, just like, like a sooner correspondence and you know, a month later and I still haven't received 
Uh, Pat? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to touch on, um, I think, like, drug safety is a huge issue. Um, like, every year there's medical transports because people taking things that they don't know um, contain <coughs> other things. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, drug awareness and education um, on, like, safe and responsible drug use and um, uh, how to, like, I guess, um, uh, yeah, if you choose to use drugs, you're in the safest and the most responsible way possible. And I think CSD can be helpful with that in terms of outreach. Cool. And uh, real quick, do you want to expand upon the program that you've just begun on that front? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sure. So um, I've been working with the Students for Sensible Drug Policy and um, uh, leading that for extravaganza. We offer um, 30 test kit rentals out um, for like free rentals, students just gave us their access card and then we um, gave them a free test kit and they just had to return it um, within the next day. And um, it's, it's we invite to get that program um, institutionalized, maybe like through the Park All Center or through some student run um, senator, like center, um, so that just, you know, students, if they, make the decision to use drugs, they have access to, um, you know, test for substances and make sure that, um, you know, people can get very seriously harmed or, and, you know, there have been fatalities in our community um, from drug use, because people are taking drugs that they don't know what they are. Um, so yeah, that, that's something that I've been working on, I hope to expand next year. Awesome, well, great job. Uh, Bhat Sheba? Um, well, I just wanted to add on to what Kian was saying. Um, I had a similar situation where um, my friends and I were being um, stalked like down the street one night um, on you know, DP and I called foot patrol and you know they told me they would handle it and everything but it would have been nice to kind of get a phone call or some sort of like response saying you know if they got the guy or not I mean it, he wasn't you know outwardly dangerous but it would be you know helpful if there was some sort of response system where you know, the person was aware of how it was being dealt with, for, you know, peace of mind. I don't have any Anyone else? So I don't want to talk about it all or expand upon some of the ideas that were brought up in the PowerPoint. Do you think they're good ideas, bad well, ideas? We'll, we'll be going to the services next. The services or, themselves? Yeah. But as far as, far as issues, um, or if any board members have anything they want to point to right now. Um, well then, I guess I, I think I'm what I have I'll, to win. Yeah. I'll um, I'll start and then I'll go to EJ. Well, actually, I've got a clarifying question. What you're asking for? Are, are, yeah. um, what kind of things are we? Asking? So right now we're just yeah. focusing on the issues, and we're going to go right back into issues, okay. more uh, solutions. Um, but definitely, um, Keon Keon mentioned groping and the the issue of sexual assault and violence in this community, and that's something that's really been underscored um, lately with um, Roshandra Urban. Uh, she's shared her story. She was at her first Isla Vista Community Services District meeting, um, and has been leading uh, the discussions with the university on how how we can uh, better move forward. And that's also something that the Isla Vista Safe Task Force is taking up right now, but. I know um, that's something that we all, we all know people in this community who have been victim to that and um, just so important for us to keep that in mind. Additionally, um, I, we've seen a lot of violent crimes this uh, over the past few months. Um, spent, Daniel mentioned the hate crime earlier. Um, someone mentioned the stabbing and, um, and assault that took place this past weekend. Um, a few weekends ago, um, a relative of mine was um, violently assaulted in Isla Vista. It's something I think all of us are, are really concerned about. I, Father Hedges, you've ha had that experience. Um, so definitely, I don't know that nothing we're, we're going to discuss here today is going to, going to be a concrete solution to say no more, but really just seeing what we can do to to make everyone a little bit safer so that they may be less vulnerable to issues. That's, a, that's really a, what brought me to put this on today. Peggy? I just like to say, you know, knowledge is power, and, and I really understand time of certification is super necessary, and there's a good system in place with the university for students to have access to what's happening 
in the community, but I think even more long term, where I think we all really need to understand what type of violent crimes happen out here and how often they happen and where they happen. Because if, if, if it's, because you only get bits and pieces, you know, and sometimes you don't even hear about things. And I think if, if the more people understand when it happens, where it happens, who it's happening to, then people can take steps to, to make sure that they're safe. So I don't know what kind of site the sheriff and the police department have set up, but I would like to see more transparency in what is actually happening in our district. Yeah. And just some, since that has come up a few times, um, if Ruben um, or uh, Kathy or Chief Olson, if you guys want to just talk about what, what the existing system is for reporting briefly. So I can speak um, to the campus piece. Um, we, we have a couple pieces um, on our website that I think might be helpful. One is a, a daily crime log. So that lists pretty much any and all police activity that's uh, handled by the, um, the campus police officers. And that's you know easily accessible and, and uh, can give you, I think, some historical data. So it goes back a number of years if you wanted to go back and and have a, um, a better look at, at terms of what you know what's happened where, um, and then we also you know we have our, our timely warnings that we send out under certain parameters, um, certainly to the, the campus community, and also in certain circumstances the Aladista community. We work closely with with Ruben and his staff to make sure that we're um, you know putting out information that's accurate and timely uh, to the extent and the requirements that we have. And so I think some of the misunderstanding is that, you know, the, the UCPD or the campus has this uh, overarching obligation to send out timely warnings um, to the Isla Vista community. And that's not always the case. And with particular um, emphasis on some of these incidents that happened over the weekend, um, just a thing um, that to note is that there were arrests made in all these cases. And so there's no more ongoing risk to the community. And so you know, they, they frown on us just sending out um, the alerts under those under those circumstances. Um, I do know there was a number of press releases uh, that went out, and right. I saw a Nixle alert on the, on that information. So I don't know again to the extent that folks are necessarily um, engaged in those platforms, but but there was uh, some pretty timely and good information um, from from what I saw. But we definitely can look to see how we can strengthen that. Um, but from again the campus perspective. Uh, crime statistics are also out there, but again, we don't we don't have a way to necessarily capture the the sheriff's department's data. So I would leave you know that piece to, to Ruben right. to be able to pull the, the, uh, the press releases. Those are done one side here. On the side because like the other night when all this occurred, uh, they called me at two o'clock in the morning, and uh, I have to get a hold of uh, our, our Kelly Hoover, who's our uh, PIO and then have her put out a press release. So she tries to do that in a timely manner. She's constantly getting called day to night and <laughs> trying to put this out. In terms of the alerts, uh, we don't have the, the alert. That's just the university uh, that puts that out. Uh, so uh, we try to get the information out there. We also have uh, recaps that we do. I don't think they were available to everyone. This just an internal thing that keeps us uh, aware as to what things are going on. And I try to brief every once in a while when we get into the IBCN community network meeting of a few things, parties here that are going on and so forth. I mean, I mean, there could be other ways that we can try to figure out how to get that information out. But that's what we have at the present time. Thank you. Did you had a clarifying yeah, question? I had a clarifying question to Mr. Olson. So um, in terms of the crime log that you keep, um, because I know it may get confusing for people given that we have two different jurisdictions of police that kind of patrol the same area. So the UCPD patrols certain parts of Isla Vista, and if your officers come in contact with a crime and have something reported to them that warrants a timely warning, that timely warning will get sent out. So just because you are UCPD doesn't mean that you uh, don't send out timely warnings for things that are in Isla Vista, but you only send out timely warnings for things that you've come in contact with, or does the sheriff's office share with you certain information occasionally for you to do timely warnings? And I, one of the reasons I'm asking is because my understanding of why you do timely warnings is because you're required to by federal law. It, yes, that's correct. So, so primarily, it, it, 
it does boil down to um, whether a UCPD officer is made aware of a particular type of incident or crime that, that again, meets the federal parameters. Um, and if it doesn't, then, you know, again, we may reach out to the Sheriff's Department and see if they want to do something more in the media. So we have those avenues, but in terms of the timely warnings that everybody um, is signed up for, if you're a student, you're automatically enrolled, staff and faculty certainly um, go in and then give us all their information and we push that out. But, you know, you just keep in mind it's, it's not necessarily a news source. So I think yeah. the expectation is, is that this will always uh, necessarily push out to, to tell me what I might want to know. It's, it's more geared around towards what you need to know. And so, you know, it's saying, hey, there's a danger, there's an incident, but here's what we want you to consider and think about how to not necessarily, um, you know, become a victim or, or have a, that type of crime perpetrated. Now, there's a lot of other crime information that we certainly push out on our website, but again, I go back to the daily crime log because that is actually a very detailed chronological log that will tell you pretty much what we're working on at any given day. And it's, um, again, it goes back a number of years, so you could go back and query it and come up with quite a, quite a bit of uh, information. And, and our crime data in terms of what happens on campus properties um, is, is all, pretty much out there and very, very transparent. So, we, you know, we're open to suggestions and how we can push that out even further. And many of you get emails throughout the year, actually. Thank you. We send our crime data uh, to your email accounts and whether you choose to click on the link, and I know that going through some of that is, is arduous, but, but that's, you know, we try to kind of force feed this information so you're, you're kind of aware and you know what the issues are on campus. Thank you. And we have uh, Supervisor Hartman to be followed by Kristen and then uh, Jonathan. I had a question and then a comment. The first is, do you analyze the data that you have in the daily crime log? So there's reports coming out and, and assessing how you have the campus police deployed or training or, I mean, how do you use the data that you collect? It's a, it's a great question. Um, so we do, we have internal reports that we produce, and we sit down with uh, the supervisors um, once a month, uh, Assistant Chief Farley and myself, and we come up with uh, strategies. So in the past we've done some, for example, uh, bait bite enforcement. I don't know if any of you have uh, seen that, but we have GPS tracking devices. Um, we certainly see that bike theft is a, a big issue on campus. We've had. Um, some issues, you know, with safety in terms of, um, we'll call them uh, peepers in the restrooms on campus. So we, so we do have a number of, uh, of issues that pop up and we, we track the data and we look at times and we do deploy officers according, accordingly uh, to that. And, you know, I'd say that it, it lends itself <coughs> to hotspot uh, crime reporting that you probably may have heard about. And so that's kind of the methodology that we follow. Thank you. And if I might follow oh, up just absolutely. a comment. Um, <coughs> we met, my office staff <coughs> and I met with uh, the CEO's <coughs> office and Joyce Dudley early this week to discuss exactly this issue, data collection. And apparently we, we don't do that uh, as well as we should <coughs> collect data about crime and analyze the data and use that then to uh, assess what we need to do more. So we're working that in this year's budget hearings that are coming up uh, and trying to figure out uh, more. But that that seems to be an important starting point for us, at least in the IB State process. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Kristen? Um, so I have two things. And for the first thing, one of my public safety concerns um, is in regards to Greek life, but not as a source of public safety issues, but as a resource that we can use. Um, Greek life in general tends to be a slightly uh, controversial topic. However, within Greek life, um, when things like sexual assault occur or crimes, there are internal structures in place in order to um, execute like punishments on like according to national standards that are sometimes more satisfying than external investigations. Um, also on top of that, the mass shooting that occurred Isla Vista was motivated by hatred for sorority girls, and that was really scary for me my first year uh, joining um, a Greek organization. And I think something that happens a lot is a lot of negative rhetoric comes up 
in regards to Greek life, but I think it's something that we should be collaborating with instead of using, not that that rhetoric isn't unwarranted, but I think that it contributes to an issue and instead like the CSD can partner with Greek orgs um, on events, on um, more reaching out and collaboration. Uh, there was issues with the new education workshop process, which is a great thing too, because then you're educating 12% of the UCSB populations since like Green Dot um, workshops are mandated for members of Greek life. Um, and then my second thing that I'm gonna bring up, which is part more of the second part of the discussion, but I have to leave at seven, that I just wanted to clarify was the external vice president of local affairs office, which is EDPLA for short, um, looked into doing a sobering uh, center through the university in that office, but unfortunately since we are like AS and like its students, um, there was a huge liability as far as addressing health issues um, and when police should be called in, but if the CSD could do something about that, that would be great. But now something that we're looking into that I brought up towards the end of the year at an IBCN meeting was a safer station, which is would incorporate the aspect of CSOs having a place where students know they can go and pick up a CSO, wait for an Uber. So that's something that would be great to collaborate with associated students with, although we can't do a service. Thank you. Um, and we have Jonathan Good <coughs> to be followed by Derek Hayes and then Michael Bean. Just to backtrack a little bit to what Joan and Dustin were talking about um, in terms of the data. I think, you know, a year ago, I spoke with two IV residents, former IV residents, who were actually working on creating a crime visualized database like New York City has. And I think this could be a chance for the CSC to be a nexus between various groups like the Full Patrol and the CPD in the county and putting together, like, you know, open data has been like a growing trend in government to like gather the data, to put it online visually, and allow the public to also know everything and to participate because then they'll be more informed because they know exactly what's happening where. Um, New York City is amazing. So you can look at per week, per 28 days, types of crime, <coughs> policing, privacy. So I think, I don't know how expensive that would be to make, but we had two volunteers willing to make it, and we're gonna do it on our own. Uh, so I think that could be something to explore. Uh, Derek Hayes? Yeah, as a survivor of May 23rd, you have to, have to come up with every day as a survivor of May 23rd. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, when you do go forward to people and you do report to the police, there's a thing called racial profiling. Uh, if you're black, you report it. You might be unreported. Um, the disconnect, I think, is part of the problem. You know, if you look at what happened May 23rd, you talk about City College. Um, if you're a UCSD student and you're complaining about something that is said about City College, they say, hmm, can't help you. So then you go looking for someone else. You go look for someone else, and you get a disconnect and you get no help. And then you have citizens that have to take actions in their own hands to protect their own life. You know, as I had to do May 23rd, to protect the lives of others in the community. But um, a selfless act, um, there was no um, mental health facilities for us. Um, if you weren't, um, I'm sorry, uh, a certain phenotype in IV, you know, they really didn't care what you had to say. If you were homeless and you saw something before it happened and you saw other things going on, other people in the car, uh, you were kicked out of the community. So really, I think it's like, you know, I keep hearing these things, I keep hearing the thing is that we are unwilling to connect as a community. You know, if you, if you inform Chief Police at Elliot Rogers and Desmond Johnson that's the collusive problems and then later on there's ma mass murder, massacre. And as a survivor, how, how do you deal with all these different issues? And the whole point was about um, liability then. Or if you know if you're not gonna live in Kansas campus, you have to live in IV, even though you knew IV was dangerous, and still people didn't listen. You go, you know, it's kind of like the, the truth is, is how we make a better community. <laughs> Tell you something, as a survivor in May 23rd, man, you've got to take, I'm sorry, actions in your own hands. You're like this brother over here, and he had to leave. It's just like, it, it, no no kind of paper trail, nothing. You know, he just observed a person, serial groping a woman in advance of sexual assault. I mean, there's so many different <coughs> things that you come, in hindsight, it's 2020. Like, the more I learned about, you know, May 23rd, the action was going on. 
I see so many red flags, and I say, well, how did this happen? You know, we've got red flags coming from everywhere. <coughs> you know, and, and since we're talking about the, the, you got the Greek and the internal thing, you got this going on, all this, but we got to become heroes in our own community sometimes, and sometimes in order to heal from tragedy, you got to go ahead and admit that what the problem was, period. You know, I was a UCSB student when I first reported to Elliot Rogers, Desmond Johnson, and anybody was here tonight. So I'm hearing better uh, survivor services, better... No, I'm saying as soon as you're off, if you're not a UCSB student, they figure out how not to take responsibility or do real police work, then you're out in the community and you're just working at Tropicana Guards at night, you know, and you're at work, but you already withdrew out of school because no one was listening. You can't, if you ain't got no, okay, you ain't got no place, homelessness is real. And you had Elliot Rogers chase you off through Ivy one night because he, the, you, he, the police knew they were not going to protect me. They were not going to protect the girl he threw the coffee in the face. So you keep teaching, telling people, if you got privilege, you got money, you're a certain class, you look a certain way, you are protected. But, and, and you belong in IV. And some of those people, I'm sorry, they got that stuff so, you know, how can you make it in IV and get away with harm? You know, how can you get away? How can you be in so, IV Derek, I have to stop you there. We have, we have a, you know, a long uh, I queue. That, but the reason but. I have to speak is I'm Derek Hayes. I, I, I defend those kids. But my life, I put my life online. I put my life online when I see Ellie Rogers. But I had reported it to them earlier. And the thing is about when I look at what happened May 23rd, the, the whole point is to make that not happen again. And, and what you do is there is no such thing as we can't all talk because, oh, Derek's off of campus. Woo, great. The, the 42 two year old, he's so scared of a 20 year old kid, Ellie Rogers. You know, I thought that was so funny. <coughs> Sorry. But I went to the Dean of Student Affairs about that, into the police. And they just thought I should be an old man and be scared, uh, not scared of a 22-year-old kid. Now, later on in life, when I say 22, that is Elliot Rogers and his associates that walk free. That person just told you right there. Derek, hey, man, you, you we, we, we have can have this uh, discussion uh, I mean, after. Have, like Father John said, there got to be some kind of community center where we can just all get along and, and, and help each other. Why should a, a person be sexually assaulted in uh, IV and got to run the campus to get help? <laughs> it, it's where, it's where, unacceptable. Where is, where is but Derek, we uh, we're we're, we're all here uh, to listen. contribute ideas. I'll call back on you after we uh, hear some more. But thank you One so much. I hear is, you, brother. If, if there's a person, no matter what race they are, no matter what religion they are, and they say that there's a problem, sometimes oh, it's not about not paying tuition that quarter, and we you know, it's out it's out of our hands. Because I had to survive my own that night. I'm sorry. I right, no, thank, my thank you. That night. And I mean that with, with support and love for the community because that love I, little love I had for that community made me up. Derek, so, thank you for sharing your story, that, but we need to move on um, to know, the next but, speaker. But how do you be penalized for taking matters in your hands when there's no protection? That's what we should talk about. How are we going to get our community together where we all actually talk? Up next, we you have know? Michael. So we have Michael Bean up next. Yeah, I, I just recently learned about the Green Dot program, and uh, I think it's really exciting. I'd like to learn more about it, and I'm wondering how the CSD could support student, staff, and community initiatives to shift the shift rate culture in the community. Yes, thank you so, so much. I, I actually, I'm wondering if anybody here is from the Women's Center or um, um, Take Back the Night or any affiliated groups who could actually tell us more about the program and how and, and how we could uh, let community members know more about it and how to participate. So. Yes, so the Green Dot program is something that um, kind of originated through the CARE program on campus but has become a campus-wide initiative and community initiative. Um, we're going on about three years um, of implementing the program. It's a national program designed specifically around bystander intervention. <laughs> Um, <coughs> two, summers ago, two summers ago, we brought um, the train uh, program to train the trainers, and we have probably about 20 something folks from campus. Um, we invited City College, I think we had um, Jane see you all here, but Jane Carroll was part of our group. So we, it was a pretty you know, broad cross section, and some of the folks have moved on, so I don't think we have 20. Trainers left, we maybe have 15 or so still on campus and working 
um, when we are reaching all of the incoming new students, freshmen and transfer students each year. Um, the CARE program has a component of it that really is focused on the bystander intervention culture shift um, concept as well. Um, it is part of the group system training that is, is out there. And it's the idea that basically it takes the, the onus off of the individual and turns it into the broader community. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. so uh, part of that is identifying uh, red dots, which are locations where abuse is happening. Mm -hmm. And the green dots are inter locations where people do an intervention. Is that correct? That's the, that's the concept behind the name, the idea of when you can intersect and to stop it. You can go to green dot um, or lucas.org. Um, however, through the CARE program, that is kind of a hub of information on campus, and there's information there that you can go to. <coughs> also, Gaucho Green Dot is on Facebook, and that's um, a broad swath of people um, from across the campus community who are participating. Sweet. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, up next, we have Sammy. And um, now that we're in our second hour, feel free to start um, throwing out um, your ideas about solutions as well. <clears throat> Hi, uh, I just had two questions actually. The uh, first one, uh, going on the topic of sexual assault, uh, one concern that I have heard in voices is actually uh, expressed at the sit-in uh, in Chio Hall uh, regarding the issue. And uh, that was that uh, sexual assault victims uh, have, not, have no way of sort of uh, getting a status on their report that they've submitted. Uh, many, are, uh, from uh, what I've heard in many cases, these have been uh, reported like lost cause. Their reports are never really uh, handled uh, on time. They're never uh, uh, oftentimes they're sort of uh, uh, disregarded in uh, many ways, but I was wondering if there was a sort of uh, way that uh, these victims can actually get a status off, uh, view a status with their report online or uh, by some other means. That's an excellent idea. I see you, Bachelor. You're on the uh, list. So uh, next up we have... Uh, one oh, second question. Sure. Real quick. Uh, this is uh, kind of a different topic, but it, it's just real quick. Uh, for uh, UCPD uh, officers, is there a specific area that they're assigned to uh, during uh, weekends, or, or is it just kind of a random in a sense? Uh, Chief? Sure, so um, the question was, are uh, UCPD officers assigned to specific areas? So it's a two-fold question. One is we certainly always have officers dedicated to campus calls for service. Um, and then typically on weekends, we, depending on the shift assignments, we have some officers that are also assigned to the Isla Vista neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and so both. Uh, so sure. within the Isla Vista neighborhood itself, is there like specific designated areas or is it just, uh, uh, no, just the Ivy in general? Not necessarily uh, specific, but I would say that, uh, and, and certainly Ruben can um, give us a little more detail, but you know, the, there's areas in particular that they would spend a little more time, you probably see them on foot, a little more accessible. Uh, so, so with that said, but there's not any specific assigned area. They're, they're gonna go uh, where they think and, and where they uh, may be needed most. Right, yes, it, it, it all depends on call volume of where, where, where things are happening at the time. Uh, they can be down at El Playa, but get called up on South Adobo or whatever. So, but they're <coughs> all over. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, up next, Daniel. Oh, I guess I just have a question to Ruben. Uh, how often does the sheriff's department get like feedback from the community? I know you mentioned that you attend the Ivy, or representatives from the sheriff's department attend the Ivy Community Network meetings, mm -hmm. um, but those aren't very representative of the community at all. You get some like people from like the UPLA office and some community members, but for a lot of the people in the community that are really, really affected by these crimes, they're not represented in, in any capacity whatsoever. Do you all have some we protocol for We have email, uh, anonymous emails, where, where I get tons of every day uh, regarding different you know, <coughs> crimes that are occurring or loud music mostly. Uh, people's uh, you know, noise ordinance type uh, calls. But again, at the IBCN community, and we're always open uh, to, uh, to speak to anyone. Okay. Thank you. Uh, up next, uh, Jeremy. Um, so I want to go back a little bit to something um, Supervisor Hartman mentioned about uh, data collection, current data collection um, regarding. Uh, mental health services as well. I don't believe, and I'm not sure on this, but I don't believe there has been a um, kind of uh, 
community assessment of, of need for mental health services. Hmm. And um, I imagine here most in the room are UCSB students, and that's, um, you know, that's great, like half of, our, half of the Ivy community is, is from UCSB students. And uh, there's access to, um, when, we, when the university brings in uh, services to students, that's obviously a benefit to the community as a whole, but it, there's another half of the IB population that those student services don't reach. So uh, that's one of the things I get from what Derek is saying. And um, when we look at past um, community issues, when we look at um, public safety or mental health issues, it's not, you know, it's not definitely not always the students who are um, to blame for, for things that happen. So it really, in terms of service provision, I really hope that we can um, look also at, at services, how Green Dot mentioned, how, how can that be available to other members of the community. As I was looking through this program, the booklet here, um, is there the, uh, the, the RAD program that looks like it's available to um, students, staff, and faculty at UCSB. Um, so I was looking at then the uh, Sheriff Citizens Academy, which may be the uh, community answer to that, but that looks like it's more focused on learning about what the police do rather than giving other residents skills uh, or, you know, so that's kind of the um, thing I'm, I'm hoping to see more of is uh, community-based um, services that all community members um, can utilize. And for those here recognizing, you know, if, if you're a student um, and you, so you have a picture of what services are available to you, consider, and I know you do this, I know everyone is working on doing this, but consider um, what services might be needed for those that aren't students as well. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Up next we have Bot Sheba. <coughs> um, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Kristen said. I think it's really important to think about Greek life as a solution instead of a problem and see them as a, as a source of leaders who can be empowered to lead the community in, um, you know, against um, these issues and kind of start these sexual assault campaigns <coughs> to educate students. Um, I know a lot of sororities actually have like domestic violence and sexual assault as their philosophy. Like, they spend the whole year raising money for the different organizations. I think reaching out and collaborating with them to do things for their community um, would be amazing and I know that they would you know, definitely be down to help out in any way they can. Um, because they, like she said, they do have their own systems and I think continuously seeing them as a problem and pushing them down um, really creates issues um, in their organization in between, you know, themselves and I think that empowering them and giving them a chance and a chance to prove themselves um, would, be, would be great. Thank you. Uh, up next, Sue. Uh, <coughs> yes. Um, up until last year, sometime in the middle of last year, I had signed on to, uh, I was made, the, the UCS Fielder system was made available to those of us that are not part of the university and that sort of just went away without any warning or anything. But I found it very valuable to get an alert at two o'clock in the morning that there had been an assault or a, 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 a attempted um, burglary or whatever. And I, I was told when I asked about it that the reason why I was no longer able to get that service was because the, the load on the servers or whatever was, was too much for the university. But if we're looking to make sure that we're all aware of what's going on in this community. I think that anybody that wants to be able to sign on to that service that lives in Isla Vista mm -hmm. should be able to do it, whether they are, I mean, I have two degrees from UCSB, and mm -hmm. you know, I've worked as a staff member for UCSB, and you know, it seems to me that we should all be able to know what's going on at this in this community mm -hmm. when it is happening. Even though there's crazy things coming in the middle of the night, you hear this ding and you know there's something that happened, at least you get up and you think twice about making sure your doors are secured, your, you know, that, you, that you've made your house and your dwelling as safe as possible. Absolutely, thank you. Um, up next, Hugh. Um, just an idea to go out there. 
um, in regards to sexual assaults. Uh, sexual violence is largely perpetrated against women, so perhaps we can integrate some type of masculinity, masculinity type program to educate men uh, on how their masculine and their upbringing may lead to sexual violence. Um, so that's just my idea. Thank you. Um, up next, Stephen. Oh, um, on Greek life as a solution, I also feel that they shouldn't be particularly limited to just sexual assault because um, I think there should also be programs uh, with, with kids as well because children often hear a lot of belligerent, drunk kids just walking around, uh, lots of like broken bottles just being tossed around in their alleyways. They're trying to play you know, just simple games out there. They don't like seeing that stuff and they become, I don't want them to become afraid of us as well and I want them I would also like for the children of the families who also live here um, um, to feel safe and feel like you know that we're not creating them as well. Thank you. Um, up next Kevin. So regarding the alert system that was uh, made available to the public but then restricted to only students uh, maybe with the two hundred thousand dollars per year uh, that could be something that, that could go towards a mutually agreed upon project that would be uh, making these servers uh, more capable of uh, uh, alerting our type of people and opening them back up to the public. Thank you. Um, up next, Daniel. Um, yeah, so I guess going back to some of the solutions that y'all were actually proposing, uh, staff program, I feel like it's, it's a really, really good idea, uh, especially having them on sworn personnel because I personally, every time I've dealt with a police officer, I've generally been met with like a little bit of smugness and attitude and it's just not a very very it's not a situation I come out feeling good about um, and one of the things I, I personally have a problem with the response ribbon was how you say oh we're available but the fact is that when, when community members do interact with police officers um, they don't feel good about it their experiences and that's why we do have these problems so I do feel SNAP is going to be a, a really really great opportunity to to do this um, and through SNAP, I feel like there should be an, a, a, an opportunity for a community to engage with the, with the sheriff's department. For example, having like one member in the SNAP team be the one that collects responses for that and delivers that to the sheriff's department, um, so that there is some sort of better mechanism that isn't just emails. So, because I mean, you send an email and then you'll you'll get like an oh thank you for the response, you know, it's been noted, but we have no idea what the process behind that is, you know. Um, like you, you can order a pizza from Domino's, and you know, you know when you put it in the oven, you know when they, you know when they do everything. But <laughs> you put in a complaint with the police department, you have no idea what happens. Um, so I, I think SNAP could be a great, great way to remedy that, and I'm really happy the CMD is thinking about doing something related to that. Thank you. Um, so we have Kyle to be followed by Michael Bean. Um, I think in addition to SNAP, just additional training for IV protocol is like pretty necessary. Like um, sensitivity training, um, making sure that they know how to interact with people, making sure they know California penal code seems like a pretty basic thing. But like I've had protocol officers like look me in the eye and tell me that drugging somebody wasn't like a crime, um, and that like when I tried to like file a police report with them, said like oh just go file one online, like just weren't available to help me and I think like that is a big issue because it seems like almost like their presence is to create a surveillance state in Isla Vista rather than to like help people who genuinely need help um, and like I think the what Daniel said like where people go to like get help from IG Foot Patrol or like ECPD and end up feeling like they weren't helped or like feeling like they were treated with like smugness or like not really like sensitively handled um, I think that's like really detrimental to the relationship, and I think that um, like sensitivity training would help. Thank you, uh, Michael B. It, it just occurred to me that we, we tend to leave people who um, can't afford or choose not to uh, be on social media, carry smartphones uh, out of our out of our thoughts, and it might be really worth looking at um, how we could have a say. A, Imagine a public, a scrolling public news feed of uh, Isla Vista news, and that could be a place where alerts could be seen for people who, uh, who aren't carrying a cell phone. Um, and 
Also, maybe a public display of um, um, the green dot, red dot um, results. You know, how is that evolving? Um, you know, so people can see you know, there's a certain amount of constructive public shaming in that too. If your house has got a lot of red dots on it, you know, um, that says something. But if the, the red dots are all uh, you know, hidden away on a server somewhere, um, Thank you. Um, and, and, and maybe the community center or the part all center or both uh, <coughs> be candidate locations for uh, a news feed. Cool. Thank you so much. And we're just um, going to take a, a few more. So if you have a comment, please get it in, um, and then we're going to discuss some of what we've heard. There will be more opportunities to speak, but um, mm -hmm. just if anyone hasn't spoken yet that wants to get it in at this time, uh, get, get your hand up soon. Your hands are Pretty got good. you guys. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, so. I just need to remember why it was recently removed. I can come back to you next. We'll come right oh, back. Oh, it was Taurus. So, got it. Um, essentially, I think that so the, the $200,000 is a lot of money. And at previous meetings, you all have discussed uh, using it for the sexual assault detective or uh, officer, however it plays out. Um, my question would be, it was also previously mentioned at some of your meetings that some of the money could possibly go towards that and have the other monies pitched in by the county or the university, however they do that. Um, if we could do like a half and half snap and detective type thing, because uh, I, I think that doing one or the other presents some serious problems to different constituencies, but both would solve something. Thank you. Uh, Sam? Yeah, so uh, I, I have two. Uh, first, I want to ad address the SNAP program because right now, uh, internally with UCIB, we're looking to expand to fill this role. Um, we've started hiring staff. We're going to have a phone number so that people can call throughout the community or with the police department so that we can pull people off of our rotational teams to do exactly what is described here. Um, so I, I feel like we can fund that, we can cover that need. Um, the second thing I wanted to address was uh, the idea of the sober insurance. I'm a huge advocate of this, um, both as a base of operations for the various programs that do operate in IB, and as the necessity to have some sort of solid infrastructure in the hotter areas <coughs> of IB. I know in the past a lot of programs have been forced to use Part All Center as their base of operations, and it's very hard for us to be able to service the public who frankly isn't walking very far very quickly with that kind of a distance between us and the hotter spots of DP and Sawmill. So I'm, I'm a huge advocate of that um, and I would love to support that in any way possible. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, so first of all, I just want to say this reminds me of ABP meeting for anyone who used to come to those. This is pretty cool that it's happening like this again. Um, but to provide some history on the SNAP program and UCIV, so what people were talking about back then, this when UCIB was first being created and when SNAP was first implemented in SLO, was that UCIB would be like the student liaisons to the law enforcement community and then SNAP would be like the law enforcement's reaching out. Because while you can have people out there, it's a different thing to have the law enforcement agency employing non-sworn individuals who are connected to that process. Because it's different to like have one of us go speak with the law enforcement agency and tell them this is what we've been hearing, this is the problem, compared to them having someone from their inside who then goes that, so it's like a two-way street. Mm -hmm. That's the, that was the, I just want to bring that history to yeah. light. Cool, thank you. Um, there was a hand right over here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. <coughs> Kelly. Kelly, hi. Um, well, I want to say that these problems that we're bringing up in IV are personal and they're global problems, and as adults, and young people and officials and people with jobs and um, you know you know how to you know how to deal with these issues victims they don't know we don't know when something happens to you you don't want to go and report it or something like that or you don't you might not know to a lot of people won't even know to and a lot of people don't ever and from that point um, like if somebody goes to a police and reports something the police and the officials, they know what to do from there. But how is somebody that has never been through that before gonna know? And to deal with these problems are things that um, 
I mean, and, and Isla Vista and UCSB is supposed to be, it's known, it has a few different, you know, stereotypical um, images. And one of them is the party place and everything like that. And a place that's also a place for crime and stuff. That is actually a stereotypical image, um, wide one that's no, no nationwide and maybe even globally. But at the same time, it's also supposed to be known as an intellectual place because there's a university right here. And the thing is, if you want to be coming from a university or, um, you know, you have, to, you have to receive training on how to deal with these things for younger people in the future. And wouldn't you like to know for yourself, for your own personal life, if you have brothers and sisters or family members or friends, or you're going to have children of your own in the future, or if you have children, you know, you want to be, you want to know how to help them because they're not going to know naturally. And, you know, I mean, some may, but you won't know because that's not really the, you know, standard and the, of society that um, is mainstream. And um, it's not about only helping certain people or thinking that some people deserve um, justice and others don't. <coughs> And so what I'm saying is, you know, the people who are in the position um, and know that they understand, like, um, crimes, they understand the significance of crimes, um, and they have the knowledge of what to do and how to find justice, and um, instead of people taking things along with them for the rest of their life, and their lives honestly get destroyed. And you can save lives by your knowledge and your understanding and your power um, that you have. And don't let somebody, just because they don't know, you just let them in ignorance, you know, let their ignorance, let them live with their ignorance. And you honestly, you know, you just watch them with their ignorance um, suffer while you, right. have the, you have the knowledge and understanding. Right, thank you so much. Help and save lives. Thank you. Important message. Uh, Jeremy? So I just wanted to um, connect um, to something else that is coming about in this fall, like with the community center coming online. It would seem important to s consider how we could leverage um, use of that space, maybe to the end, to the service mm -hmm. of the public safety. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's concerning to me that I don't know of any conversations uh, that are taking place about how the community center will actually be utilized once it's opened, uh, but that might be a different, that's obviously a different conversation. Um, but part of that would seem like could be um, maybe some type of uh, way to address public safety issues. Thank you. Uh, Daniel? Oh. Um, I guess just my final question for Ruben. Um, would the Sheriff's Department be willing to commit to having citizens be more intimately involved in making the process more transparent uh, in terms of, like, you know, the information of crimes being reported to the people and, you know, what what happens when crimes do get reported? Um, would that be some a commitment the Sheriff's Department would be willing to, to make either with CSD or, BC, or UCIB? I would just hate to leave this meeting um, with everyone, like, talking and then, well, it's something I can bring up. Uh, you know, I don't make the decisions at, this, at, at least at this level I do, but I bring everything up to chain command. Uh, and, and when you're asking, making it more transparent, is what, looking at laws and things like that? I mean, these are things that we already do. Well, having some flow of communication, you know, um, having, having like, like a, a makeshift citizens, of, uh, like, what, what, are, what are they called? Citizens, like, advisory boards? I don't know. Like they build boards up, essentially watch over the sheriff's department to make sure that they're fulfilling their duties. To watch over the sheriff's department, essentially, yeah. that like uh, yeah. it's the board of yeah. Uh, Citizen review board. Yeah. That 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 again is something that has to go up the chain of command. Thank you. So uh, I can give you a commitment. Thanks. And Janet. Yeah. Um. First, uh, I just want to say that I agree with all the ideas that went out about being able to inform people of where the hot spots are. Um, I think Jonathan and Peggy and numbers brought that up. I, I really support that. And as far as the sobering center goes, I, I can see why there was a consideration for the liability, um, because you really do need medical personnel there who are trained to be able to 
until very soon Betty began to go to the hospital. Uh, having worked um, with people with injuries, who they were drunk when they got it, <coughs> and then they regain consciousness. A lot of times there's a lot of violence with that. People wake up slugging. So at the sobering center, I think it's a great idea, but you would have to partner to get the right personnel there. And my suggestion is to talk to Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. Um, they like to do things in the community. They like to be a part of various outreach things in the community. And they might be a good resource to um, give you ideas on how you can staff it and maybe even more. Thank you. And I'll just um, provide quick con context for that. Um, because so this was an ongoing effort, especially last year. Um, it's really on pause right now, kind of on ice. Um, but it, it involved a Cottage Hospital, um, the downtown Santa Barbara Sobering Center, Santa Barbara City College, UCSB, the Sheriff's Office, the Third District Office, um, County Alcohol, um, Drug and Mental Health Services. So it was a true team effort. And um, in, in how it would be set up, there would be two um, two medical staffers um, and at this time uh, we haven't gotten to a point where uh, there's been enough partners to go into it because it, it even if it's a say the county or the university large organizations looking into this it still needs to be a multiple yeah. multiple uh, involved endeavor but um, yes and uh, we'll, I'm gonna come right back here uh, okay. after uh, this last comment because uh, we are at 730 um, Ask a really quick follow-up question. Yes. Did that conversation ever involve um, neighborhood clinics? They were at the meetings, but I think more as a as a yeah. neighbor. Neighbor, yeah. Because we they were at the time they were looking at this building yeah. using it, yeah. um, so they were in the discussion, but okay. never as a service provider. Okay. Um, so Pragan, we have you. Cool. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, in. Backwards order. Uh, Ruben, you mentioned that the Isla Vista Foot Patrol does logging of things. Um, so the way that I interpreted that was um, in correlation with uh, Chief Olson's comment that they do logs. And so is it similarly publicly available with like that? No, it's just that one is an internal, it's just a recap of what happened like the, you know, during the night. What we, what we responded to, so that way our administration can, can see and uh, have a picture as to what we dealt with during the night. Cool. And then the second comment was uh, the use of the community center space. So I think that it's a really good idea. Previously at this board, it's been talked about having um, an expansion happen of the Francisco Torres, um, or I guess Santa Catalina, um Towers CSO location but perhaps using the community center space instead or the Pardal center space as previously used during large events by um, uh, personnel that actually like, stage their, their medical area. Thank you so much. Um, so at this time we're going to have um, some board discussion on, on everything that we've just heard. Um, and we probably will be able to take more comment, but just to allow uh, board members to speak. And real quick, I'll just summarize some of the overarching themes we've heard. Um, better reporting of crimes that's accessible by all community members. Um, better response to traumatic incidents, especially um, sexual assault and violent crimes. Um, reaching out to affected communities of hate crimes. Um, looking out for um, the safety of people who are under the influence of alcohol and other drugs. Um, analyzing data as it comes in so we know how to best serve the community um, and better follow up for victims and other people who come in contact with law enforcement. Um, those are some of the overarching themes I've written down. But um, we're going to start off with Jay and then we'll go down. Yeah, um, uh, the moment I raised my hand, uh, what I was going to say is, is that um, so I attended one of the uh, meetings about the sobering center and one of the uh, key issues there is that downtown Santa Barbara, they're a city and so they contract for police services, they contract for jail services, and so anytime they want to book somebody into the jail, there's a booking fee and it costs them money. And so it actually saves them money to set up a sobering center because it saves them the booking fee even if it costs them money in order to handle the people. Uh, and so here we've got the problem where we don't have the booking fee overhead, and so it just looks like a giant cost. And so the question was then constantly who would pay it, 
And then the conversation would turn into um, some, some, some people were saying maybe the people who are um, put in the sobering center should be forced to pay it. And so there would be essentially like <coughs> a fee to them uh, for having gone through that program. Uh, and, and that fee looked really large. And so then, so then so it, 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 it turned into a massive conversation about who would pay for it, uh, more so, I think, than necessarily the liabilities, um, although that would come up. Um, I, I wanted to bring up something that I, I, I keep hearing this comment about the, um, I can inspect it, I can also do it over to you. <laughs> I keep that the, uh, no, it was, it was Sue, um, that the, um, the university uh, had stopped doing the text message service to non-students because of server load. As somebody who does that sort of, actually has built that specific service for the Student Activist Network here, I, I just don't believe it. It costs 0.4 cents to send a text message. Um, and the, the server resources for that are essentially nothing. Um, so I, I figure there's got to be something else going on in relation to why they don't want to send text messages to the non-students. I, yeah. I don't know what that is. Um, I have a question for the UCIV yes. person. Um, so is UCIV able to help non-students? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wanted, to, I wanted to make certain of that because you were talking about expanding and doing things yourself. Um, I have, and then I've got one comment about essentially the uh, the SNAP program. Uh, actually, it's like, it, well, it's giving away two comments that are sort of related about the SNAP program. So one thing I, I'm not, I, I, like, I'm, I'm curious what the, some of the peop, other people on the board's like, thoughts are when they were like, thinking this through, like um, ways in which, and actually this, I guess it was, it might have been Daniel Torres uh, who, had, who um, had brought this up, or maybe I'm misremembering who it was, but um, that the uh, SNAP program could potentially help transparency. Uh, and I'm wondering if, how that would work because I think that a lot of the um, a lot of the transparency <laughs> issues seem to be more like there isn't a good pipeline for in either investigation processes like essentially the dominant <laughs> speech problem um, the uh, I'm wondering will the snap program actually be able to succeed in solving the transparency issues it does sound like transparency seems to under underscore a lot of these separate and diverse issues that people have um, and I'm also always I like whenever I hear about the snap program I wonder you may have seen this funny graphic, which is, uh, when I say funny, but it's also depressing as well, um, which is uh, trying to describe the difference between um, equality and equity, and, and looking at, um, there are people of different, different heights that are trying to look over a fence in order to see a ball game, and each one of them gets to have one little block, and that's equality, you know, like one crate to stand on. And then you have um, equity, where you take, well, the person who needs to get the, the highest gets, gets, gets two blocks, and then the person who needs to get a little, little bit gets one block, and then the other person gets no blocks, and you just redistribute all the blocks. Um, I, I look at our community, and I wonder who are the people who are currently least being served, um, the people who are currently um, feel the most disenfranchised, or when they come to some of these, these discussions and meetings, um, feel essentially the most frustration at, the, at, at the, the, the things that they're dealing with. And I honestly wonder, is that the people who are getting warnings and issues about parties? Hmm. Um, and this, this, is, this is coming from somebody, right, who has, I mean, I wrote a, this, that article in 2004 that sometimes I'm blind for to this day about how, well, you know, IV could, sorry, Halloween could be fun if IV were a democracy and people like poking me is like, oh, you're really, really pro-party and all sorts of stuff. But are the party people the people that we need to be allocating these resources towards, or is it the sexual violence issues? Is it the fact that we don't have a Spanish-speaking um, person who's able to coordinate with the, um, with the families in the area? Um, I was actually, I was kind of excited when, I, when, when UCA, the UCAB person said that like, the UCAB is interested in stepping up and trying to do some of those things, because maybe that would free up some resources for us to concentrate on, 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 on people that maybe are more being screwed, I'll just put it that way, by the, by the system right now. But, but I don't know if that's the case, and I, so I kind of one of the things I'm curious about is like what other people's thoughts on that are. So. Thank you, uh, Director Hedges. As much as I have loved um, administration, faculty, staff, students, and all others associated with the university, um, my eyes have mostly been on those disenfranchised within our community, um, uh, and in many cases, they are those who have perhaps even been students at some point or another. Those who have stayed in Isla Vista, those who have two degrees from here, or perhaps even more. Um, I've known folks on the streets that had degrees from UCSB who were not served and weren't really part of the community. Um, there is the data that we can collect if it's given transparently um, really gives us a power to make good decisions. 
And so many of our decisions, so many of our attitudes are formed not so much from data, not so much from true reporting, as they are from bits and pieces. Um, one bit that I want to throw out that I hope does get quantified at some point is um, a crime against oneself that I have seen all too often within this community. Those who have taken their lives. Um, one may say that that's a, a choice that they made, but it reflects a sad disenfranchisement, perhaps the saddest, that folks sometimes get to when they are not listened to, when they have been bullied, when they have been assaulted. And all these things do come to one place, which is tragedy. I cannot argue more for the need for a crisis stabilization unit within Isla Vista, whether it's a sobering center or a mental health one or whatever the heck you want to call it, and however we want to st staff it. But at some point, um, I, I, I hope that helps stabilize the crisis of this town. It will be preempted. Thank you. Director Grant? Thank you. Uh, I just want to first off uh, thank everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, and I just want to say I really appreciate all the feedback that we're getting tonight. Um, one of the things that I have been hearing as a common theme is something that I think is really in a lot of ways the story of Isla Vista, which is that there are so many different service providers that are doing things that are similar uh, to one another, but not mm -hmm. quite exactly the same. And this mm -hmm. even goes all the way up to the levels of the law enforcement level, where we have a very unique situation where we have these two completely separate jurisdictions that often have a lot of incongruence in the way that they both, um, both the way that they interact with the community, but also uh, in the way that they uh, do sorts of outreach with the community. Um, and I, I, even as we're talking about something that seems, I think, to a lot of us very simple, which is the, the alerts, I think that um, it, it's distressing to me to think that some of the, you know, if, if, that if I am the victim of a crime and I, uh, it, the difference between that crime getting reported to the wider community if the perpetrator is at large, uh, the difference between that getting reported to everyone and not is whether or not I interact with an officer from one department or from another. Um, because I think that at a certain point there is a, there's a level of expectations that get set by the existence of uh, services like that, by the existence of letting people know um, that um, you know even even if it's you know one agency is doing one thing and one agency <coughs> is not, um, that's still I think it it, it really uh, leaves a lot of people feeling very very wanting. Um, in regards to some of the ways that we can help um, on this issue, um, I think that both the ideas for more community policing uh, through something that resembles the SNAP program in San Luis Obispo. Um, and also um, some sort of a, I don't know if it's a sexual assault investigator or a detective. I think these are both really good ideas that can be pursued. I would be really interesting in hearing more about the ways that we can partner with other entities that are out there uh, for something like a, a, a sexual assault uh, detective or investigator. Uh, because I, I think that that's something where we really have the opportunity to work collaboratively with, with other agencies. Um, you know, it, one of the big things that um, was talked about at the uh, recent sit-in this past month um, that was led by Roshandra, who came to our first meeting, as I think Ethan mentioned, is this idea that um, there, there isn't really a, a proper channel with which um, there, or there isn't like a channel that everyone knows about. There's no like widespread um, feeling that if so this thing happens to me, then I can go through these avenues and this is how it is going to get handled and this is how I'm going to be followed up with. So even if it's something that also includes some sort of advocacy role or some something that can walk people through the process, I think that that could be uh, really valuable as well. In, and in regards to the um, the, the SNAP program and something that resembles that, 
I think Jonathan brought up a really good point when he said that there's a difference between uh, having a peer-to-peer -peer program that tries to uh, essentially help out the law enforcement by kind of uh, heading off some of these noise violations that may otherwise be occurring if it weren't for the work that UCIB does, um, and helping direct people to the resources that exist, and having a group of students that are non-sworn personnel that are a part of that organization and are involved in that organization's operations because it really affects the way that these law enforcement organizations do their policing. I think when, when, you, when you would have that student or young person or whatever it is, community-oriented uh, policing arm. So I, I, I would challenge everyone to really start looking into the ways that we could design some sort of a program around that um, because, you know, it, I think this is an idea that is really gaining momentum, uh, especially in on the Central Coast. San Luis Obispo has had this in place, I believe, since the mid to late 1990s, um, and uh, Santa Barbara City College recently instituted something very similar. Um, I think that the the common the two common things that I've heard are um, the need for more community-oriented policing and the need for better uh, communication between agencies and, and, and ways of communication between uh, victims and the community at large. So that, I think that's all that I have. Thank you. Director Jordan. Okay. Awesome. Thank you everyone for coming this evening. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of people. It's great. Um, and I also did want to thank UCPD, IB for Patrol, and the Sheriff's Department. I know that they've gotten a lot of, we, we keep talking about things that are going wrong, but um, with all the things that go wrong, I still go to sleep at night, safe in my bed in Isla Vista, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, I find, I felt, looked over each of these plans, and I think they're great. I think that the CSOs are super helpful. I walked home with one the other night, um, but I think that the way that it stands as it now is, of course there's room for expansion, but I don't know if that's going to be like something that will be more of an immediate change that will reflect in the community in the same way that a lot of these other ones would. Um, uh, if you, if we look at, um, Snap. I actually had a question for Jonathan for clarification, if possible. Just because I was reading through it, it says it utilizes student workers to be the first responders to noise complaints, which is not what UCIB is doing. And it says student workers issue warnings off and officers and deputies are called to the scene if noise continues after the warning. But I feel like that's kind of what we're doing with UCIB. Where's the difference? Well, back then, UCIB didn't exist yet. So we were still figuring out what would happen, but another thing that SNAP was proposed to do, or our version of SNAP was proposed to do, was to be like the liaisons between law enforcement and the community. So like, even someone going out who speaks Spanish in the family area, mm -hmm. and working with them to figure out how law enforcement can better serve them. So I think you can, I think what's in here is one is what SLOW does, but you can imagine a uh, dozen of things that student employees or non sworn employees of the <coughs> law enforcement agency could do to better reach out. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to kind of touch on the fact that I, I'm trying to be very cognizant of our funding, and if there are other ways that we could receive funding for a program, or if it's already there, I don't think we should really try and reinvent the wheels. So I just thought I'd bring that up. And if other resources are willing to contribute and really take those steps and have already been kind of put into motion, I don't really... I think that there's a lot of ways that we could like cause change immediately within the community through like other avenues. Um, I wanted to touch on the sexual assault investigator. Um, I went to the sit in a couple weeks ago and it was a really eye-opening experience for me. Um, and I know that Rose here and I'd love to give space if she'd like to share her story whenever I'm done. But um, I really feel like the burden should not be placed on the victim in these situations and I think that um, if we had a sexual assault investigator, they could really make sure that the process is really streamlined and seamless for um, victims. I think that that would be a very beneficial um, method for our community, and I think it would also be one of those things that we'd see that change immediately, and that's really Im important to me. And there's clearly, that area is lacking in my mind in a way that we already have CSOs that are executing, and it's not a lacking service, it's just something that could be better improved. So that's kind of where I see the difference there. Um, and in the same with the sobering center, I actually really loved your language when talking about a crisis stabilization center because I, like you said, I really don't see why we should we shouldn't always be gearing things to just like 
the drunk kids. Yeah. And like, <laughs> to be honest, and I think that having a crisis stabilization center, as well as like a resource center in Isla Vista on a variety of issues or topics that could kind of be umbrella that the sobering center could be umbrellaed underneath, I think could really touch on a lot of public safety issues without catering to one specific demographic of students, um, generally students who are over intoxicated. So that's kind of my thoughts on that, in case you're wondering. Thank you. And before we go to the director, guys, quick clarifying question. Yeah, no, it, it wasn't necessarily a question as much as I think the distinction between UCIB and the SNAP program is that the SNAP employees are the ones that respond to the noise complaints. They're the ones that, like, take down the report as, like, officers instead of where UCIB goes to people and tells them, hey, if you don't turn your, you know, stereo down in the next five minutes, then you will be liable to get a citation from mm -hmm. a actual sworn officer. So my question with that would be, is that like an increase in bureaucracy that's just going to kind of, you know, deep blue, like make it kind of like a deeper process mm -hmm. in like the processes in which we kind of um, receive citations <laughs> or anything else? So now when I get a citation, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I'm just kind of wondering about the SNAP program because I'm not as familiar mm -hmm. with it. Um, and also, I feel like I would be much more receptive to someone like a peer than I would be of like, I don't know, maybe someone who would still consider themselves to be an officer in general. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I, I think what you're saying is um, yeah. for SNAP in other places, they're um, dispatched from when someone calls the police, whereas UCIV mm -hmm. proactively responds but is not dispatched mm -hmm. from law enforcement. Is yeah, that correct? We, we're, uh, the, the model we're moving into this coming year is that there will be a number distributed throughout the community so that individual company members can dispatch uh, UCIB personnel who are trained and have a direct line to the police should there need to be that connection. Cool. And I think that that's a really cool part of that is that like if I wanted to call the cops I would call the cops. You know what I'm saying? So that they would be able to respond to it but if I want my neighbors to turn down the volume I'd call UCIV and the difference for me too is still like that trigger reaction of jumping to calling the police when something so little goes on and now we make it into this big word deal. So that's why I really love UCIV is making something that really does encourage community instead of you know jumping more to the police action. Thank you. Director Geis. Okay. Well first of all I think you guys did a great job of putting yeah. this together and putting this on and putting the community forum on and the participation we're getting from the sheriff and the university and the third district office. So I, I think they have our attention on providing public safety. So um, my only little bit of confusion that I still would like to hear from the community and the university and the sheriff is, is that is the violent crime that's going on, is it all going on in IV? Or is it also happening on campus? And if it's happening on campus, is it students against students? And if it's out in IV, I'm starting to get the feeling it's it's non-students or it's people from outside the community that are committing those crimes, that you know they're visitors to the community, and that's how that violent crime is happening. Is that is, am I, is my feeling right, or do we really need to look at the statistics? I can't speak for. Uh, on campus, but uh, it's both out here in Isla Vista. Like recently, the uh, stabbing and thing that we had were uh, people from Mongo, right? Uh, that were down here, uh, and uh, there was another incident. In fact, uh, the hate crime that occurred back a little while ago, they were not from here, yeah, they right. were from out in Galita area uh, that were out here playing <coughs> basketball at the, at the park. Okay, uh, so. <coughs> but do we have some student versus student crime going on we do, in Isla we Vista? Do, we, we, okay. we do have but that. is it of the, the violent nature or is it more of it's the... It's more of the alcohol, uh, binge drinking and, and that type of thing. And the fights and the, the fights kind of and that occur, yeah. Hmm. I think it just helps to understand a little bit more the data to try and say, well, what... Okay. How do we solve the problem on campus versus how do we solve the problem in Isla Vista? I don't know if they're they're the same, or yeah. if they're very similar. Well, Officer, Officer Miller um, does a presentation only for FSSP students, but it was like, I don't know if which jurisdiction he falls under, but he did this great presentation for all of us, giving us all of the statistics of how many students mm -hmm. um, get in fights and how many students go to the hospital, and made it really funny for us. I found out we like, 
drink more kegs in Rhode Island or something. It was like great, and he made it funny. And at the end, they gave away a bike, and he like basically dared everyone to not get any of us like to have the cops called on any of us the first night, and kind of like basically kept us updated on if anybody had that kind of issue. Um, and I felt like that really encouraged our group of students. One was there. You, mm -hmm. During FSSP, I feel like it really like encouraged all of us to like take it into our own hands to make sure that we were all being safe and knowledgeable about how the community was. And he talked to us about like locking our doors and windows and the statistics of break-ins in the dorms. And I just think that like a presentation like that or that kind of information being available in a really public source could be super helpful, especially when you have like somebody so like relatable, you know. Kind of giving and, it to you. And I agree with that on the yeah. prevention at the university level. What I worry about is. How do you do the prevention on the outsiders coming in and that yeah. behavior That's that is not acceptable in a community, that violent behavior, how do you keep them out? And, and I don't know how, that, how you solve that. Because I was talking to my own kids at home where I use CSP students and I go, what changed? This used to not happen when I was a student. I didn't, I didn't think there was all this violent crime. They said, oh, it just wasn't reported. And I go, no, I, oh. I didn't see it happening in the old days. So, yeah. Well, the university it's, it's spent $40,000 for Halloween to send out messages via Pandora, um, <laughs> telling people to stay at home and that Isla Vista, if you come here, you're going to get arrested. To everywhere else. So yeah. it started all the way down in San Diego um, and so the, that's what, how far it broadcast. It change. <laughs> so it's pretty, it's pretty interesting now too, like I think that the university, and also a lot of us like, as students, you know, that keep it local, I think a lot of us take that really seriously. Like I don't bring my friends in during big weekends and I think that's really a culture change that's gonna be happening not only on the police's side, but also internally as members of the community really realize that it's just as much our responsibility as the cops, you know? Yeah, not allowing also the you know, the outsiders into your party is yeah. one of the yeah, things. Yeah. Like when that noise ordinance kicked in, I would, I would say last year, the major, you know, majority of the students that live here, the, you know, they went off to either the concert or back to their homes, and the ones that we found walking on the streets looking for a party to crash were all out of towners mm -hmm. from Oakland and LA and everywhere else. Yeah, and um, real quick, I'll just uh, give my uh, thoughts and then go back to you all. but. Um, and go back out to the public for anyone who hasn't been able to speak. But um, I echo a lot of what, um, what you all have um, shared as far as your priorities and um, really what I appreciate about tonight is even though a lot, of, a lot of what was discussed may not be something that the CSD goes out to tackle as one of our first efforts, um, we have a lot of service providers here who, um, who can do something about it and us all working together to address it. Um, out of all of the programs that we've discussed, I'm definitely most interested at this point in expanding the CSO program because I do see it as an excellent opportunity um, to help out people who are really vulnerable during the most uh, turbulent times. Um, there's many, many instances where I've, um, I've escorted people who a lot of times are my friends, sometimes not, but just people who shouldn't be walking around it alone at night. And, um, that's great, and I hope that so many more people have that opportunity. Um, because right now, on the weekends, when, when you are walking alone, uh, there, there are a lot of risks, um, unfortunately, that, that can happen. I also see it as sort of low-hanging fruit, because right now there is a very successful program on campus, um, a program that is well-administered, um, and a program that comes out into Isla Vista, but only on call. Um, and with that, I, I hope that we can uh, look into expanding it, um, especially because it's, it has had such great success and right now it's held in high regard. And I also, with everything that we have to set up over the next year, um, I think anything that we can expand upon rather than completely create new um, will be helpful for, for our formation process going forward. Um, and additionally, as I mentioned before, um, it is something that's been desired um, by, by many stakeholders, including the UCSB trustees. Um, so that's definitely something I look forward to discussing uh, with UCPD um, and something that we have discussed in our um, university negotiations thus far. Um, so uh, I have Jay and then Father John and Spencer. Um, what, so you said we're going out again to, yep. mm -hmm. when, when we go back out for public comment, I'm specifically interested if there's anybody who, um, 
uh, thinks that that would not help them. And I'm also particularly interested in um, uh, Rose's thoughts on uh, whether a expanding the CSO program is something that you feel would address some of your concerns, um, or whether you'd be more uh, have been more happy with uh, any of the other alternatives, including potentially the sexual um, assault detective that was uh, brought up before. Yes, and we'll we'll come right to you, uh, Father John. Um, this is all about culture change. I mean, what what we are doing here is is. Um, uh, is, is something that ought to be celebrated and we ought not to miss this moment as being something to be celebrated because here uh, we, we have an empowered body which has been given to uh, uh, elected and uh, maybe not funded but at least um, an unfunded mandate <coughs> you know we have to do what we're doing <laughs> unfunded or not um, uh, to, to begin to address these questions in an orderly, professional, statistically informed kind of a way. And out of that is going to come some change. And uh, we have all too long been stigmatized. That's one of the reasons why I don't like the idea so much of a sobering center, but I like the idea of a crisis stabilization. On account of, we don't want to keep having that stigma on this community that this is a place that needs a bloody sobering center because it's so drunk all the time. Something's wrong with that. But on the other hand, if we begin to address whole human problems, and that's what this body's doing, you know, looking at all, not just our individual concerns out of our individual pains and those of those we've heard, as much as we want to fix them all, but yet to begin to see what it is that will make this community grow into the in, into the town that it really ought to be. And that's, that's just delightful. It's good to be part of it. Thanks. Uh, Spencer, then we're going to go out to Row, and then we are uh, going to move towards wrapping up. Yeah, I, I just had a couple more thoughts, um, really bouncing off what you had to say, <coughs> Father John, and uh, the conversation that was had over here. Thank about you so much for coming. Um, the people from out of town coming inside the community and the culture change that we have seen that's been positive, which is that there seems to be less of a desire from people who live here to want to bring in people from out of town, yeah. whether they're yeah. friends or yeah. whether they're acquaintances, whatever yeah. it is. And I th just want to really <coughs> uh, strongly state that um, that is something that's been really positive and something that is not a given. And the that's it's a culture change that could dissipate so often as I think a lot of temporary changes have in Isla Vista if um, something like that is not institutionalized into something. And um, I remember I had a real, actually like philosophical awakening moment um, a couple years ago when I was talking to someone just about the concept of, of um, uh, whether or not it's, uh, whether or not change comes from the people or whether it comes from uh, like an action that a government takes. Um, and I remember the, the person spelling out to me really clearly that if, if you go back and, and, and look throughout history, it's always, uh, it always starts with the people, but it gets institutionalized through some sort of a program. And specifically, I think that one of the things we should be looking towards when it comes to making sure that we keep our large events safe and local and making sure that we keep our community safe and local as a whole is uh, having some sort of way of regulating uh, who is able to come in for the large events. Um, having some sort of way of taking uh, Deltopia and Halloween to a lesser extent now, but which is a, an event that is um, really just a, a giant um, mess in the sense that there is, no, there is no order or organization to it. And providing that some uh, more organized structure bringing some of this alternative programming that has been really <coughs> successful into the community and making this a more cultural oriented event um, I think that that is, is really something um, that we should be thinking about long term as a way of, of institutionalizing that that culture against um, bringing in people from the outside well, thank you uh, Ro I know uh, you weren't here for uh, the initial public comment but is there anything you'd like to share My thing was when I when I came with my story, I didn't come here for my story to ask the CSD for help. Like I'm pretty sure that was, I, 
I needed anybody who could help, who would help, and that's what I have always been asking for. So I never went to one entity and said, help me. I let it be known that I wasn't getting responses by the police department. I was told that I was out of jurisdiction at UCPD, I was still control inside of our police department. When when I reported, since I reported to UCPD, it should have been taken to a Title IX office. That just did not happen. So that would deal with communication. Had UCPD known that in your regulations you are to report to Title IX, even if that student doesn't want to make her report herself, then that is what you do so that that student can get the resources. Like these are simple things. So when you address communication and you have these officers and these people who are put in positions that know what they are legally required to do, that that's communication right there could have canceled out a lot of the stresses or a lot of the things that I went through and other people have to go through. Um, so when I have to come somewhere or I go anywhere and speak out, it's just because I'm looking for that specific form of help. Um, and then when I have, like, we, we have the people in power here who, I had an officer tell me it's not a legal obligation, but only a moral oath that we take to protect and serve. It's just understanding and recognizing that these are people who police this community and still wear this uniform with this belief. I understand that with this uniform on, you believe that it is not your legal obligation, and it can be legal that it's not your legal obligation to protect and serve. But you are sitting here in a car that says to protect and serve. Like, this is what we believe. Everybody doesn't know it's not legal and it's just a moral oath that you take. But it's important to let that be known in this community so that we do expand people like CSO or normal people who are going to take that seriously and say, even though it's a moral obligation, you will never hear that come out of my mouth because I feel like it is my legal obligation. It's my human right to protect and serve my community. But we got people in positions of power that wear these uniforms that behind closed doors will invite people like me to come to her office to explain real problems and then get that response. And that's why I didn't feel safe where I do not feel safe in my community. Because I know that the next day this person is still going to put on the same uniform and is going to drive around this community. And is going to deal with whatever case, however they please to deal with it. So yeah, when we talk about a sexual assault detective, I, I want the next person to be able to have a sexual assault detective. I want them to not meet an officer like that. I want them to do anything that I didn't. I wasn't afforded any of those things, and I just had to come to places like this to speak and say, I needed this in my instance. I'm not saying this is going to work for everybody. What I did, I told my story, and I said where things could have went better on my behalf, and it's not because I felt they could have went better. It was literally, it's in a book that you should have made this report to this person in order to help me finish my education, because I would have been given resources on the educational field where UCSB said they could not help me. It was out of their jurisdiction. But Title IX expansion, that says differently. So communication and what do you say, advocacy, and the, the, this is all things that, it's, it's basic stuff, we hear it and we know we can't help. It's just, it's good that we, we do have a platform here where we can talk about getting a detective and we can work for that. My demands, when I bought that for and then Alejandra's demands, demands that are always bought for that is literally from places of her where we, it's last minute. We don't have time to organize and come up with beautiful things like this and get the funds. Like we literally get last minute and you have to go to somebody face and demand exactly what you need. You ask for what you want and you just be prepared to get it. And that's something that I did. Like I still got to say, no, you can't come with me with another um, um a, another agenda because you signed for these demands. Like so now I get to hold you to it because you put your signature on it. So if, if you can do things, it's not just one way to do everything. Just like my detective, he, he could have did stuff the right way. He did it his way. He could say everything's not wrong. He didn't have to call me every day, but it would have helped when I had a video of somebody drugging me, you understand? It would have helped when I'm sending you emails saying I, I, I need somebody to see this video, but I'm standing outside a police station and they won't even take it because it's not in their jurisdiction. We talked about bringing outsiders, like keeping outsiders outside of here, but we all live in Isla Vista. It's not just UCSB students. When we bring up that question, like we have SBCC students that live here. We have regular families who, who like, you know, people are not good in these families and they commit crimes and they live in this community. So it's not about outsiders. Everybody that lives in IV is not a UCSB student. I'm a UCSB student that was told that because I was raped by a student who was not a UCSB student that my school had no jurisdiction. Like, that's how crazy jurisdiction gets when we're here. So it's not, we can't pinpoint the problem to one person or anything, but we understand we have public safety entities that need to know that it's not just legally you don't have to protect and serve. It's if you're in that position, you are policing this community, act like you care. Show some care because then you have people like me who I'm not going to sit down and let you not care when I know I'm going to speak up afterwards. And that's just, that's how I got to where I am in this position where it's just like, I'm not going to stop talking until something happens. Like, for me, period, I don't know where I have to go, but I go outside and talk to strangers. I stop LAPD and let them know what's going on here just because it's a problem with me. And somebody needs to come inside and look at what is going on because it is important. That's that's literally it. But you already know, when we talked about the detective, I'm like, that. I wish we could get 100 of them because it was five <laughs> cases my day. And I didn't get a UCSB alert, but I'm a student. But there were two alerts sent my same day. Also, the reason I didn't get an alert was because the, the position of the campus query wasn't filled. 
But then I check my email and there are two alerts out. So what was it about my alert that wouldn't alert people to somebody that is actually drugging someone and raping them and laying next to them when that's not an uncommon story at Isla Vista? These stories aren't uncommon. That's just talking about sexual assault. But we could go into other crimes and the crimes that don't go reported or the ones that don't get the alerts but should. Like we just have a lot, we, we, we need help and it's good that we are here and people can understand like this is not a perfect position but there are ways like, the, there are ways that we can fix it. So it's just interesting and it, it's a beautiful thing to be able to be here and hope for it. But understand that I'm not just a person like that who's gonna hope. I'm just gonna continue to talk and fight for things like that. And any list of demands that I gotta come up with, I could just shoot them to somebody's desk and that's that's how it's gonna go because I I can't, I, I, have, I don't have this. I don't, I'm not a member of this, you feel me? But I can't come up with a list of demands and sit in the office and make sure that my voice is heard. And with that being said, that's how I get back to me. That's how people get back to me. That's, that's the people power. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, this has been a fantastic opportunity for all of us to hear from the public about ideas um, and to share some of what we've been working on and what we've discussed. Um, there's obviously a lot of ideas out here, and it's it's unfortunate that um, that this does need to be a, a top priority. But we are very lucky to now have this body, this organization that can do something about it, that can. Uh, not just discuss this, but move towards a solution. So I'm really grateful for everyone who was here tonight. I'm really grateful for the participation of everyone. Um, we will have a follow-up discussion to this at our next uh, board meeting, um, and probably at the meeting after that, and probably at the meeting after that. <laughs> There's a lot to discuss. Um, and at, at this point, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn, um, but if you had something that you have to get in before Oh, then. I was going to make the motion to adjourn. A second. Okay, moved yeah. by uh, Brant, seconded by Jordan, 808. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Wait, I'm sorry, is there public comment? We can't finish this vote until then. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? So ordered, we are adjourned at 8 or 9 p.m. Uh, thank you so much.